we interact with people. Uh, there's different ways that we maybe greet people. Um, we come across many different ones. Um, but generally, how do you start your conversation? If I were to come up to you and say, hi, how are you? What would you say? Fine. And then usually what follows after that? If you don't really know the person, what usually follows after it? We do it here all the time. How are you? Yes, but to continue the conversation, the icebreakers, we usually ask about, and this is very common in Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania is notorious for having it so erratic, it's the weather. Right? Think about it. These last two weeks, what was it like? Did we not, like, last week have, like, almost, like, 90-degree weather? Then think back. Just, it, was, it wasn't that long ago. It was almost like 80 degrees, 90 degrees last week, and this week we had snow. So it becomes a topic of conversation. Now, it's kind of bounced about around. That's usually what we do. We just ask people, we're like, hey, it's cold out. Yeah, no, I'm gonna, I don't like the winter weather. I don't like snow or whatever. We talk about those things. What's the other thing that we usually talk about? Well, there's kind of a variation, but like the biggest next topic in general that most people want to kind of icebreaker is the price of gas. Right? If you ever drive through town, some other town that's not your town, you'd be like, oh man, that place is like three cents cheaper. That gas station, we're going there. I mean, you're going to drive 20 miles to another town to save three cents a gallon. I mean, that's okay. I, I'm not judging you or anything. I'm just saying that you're going to... Sp Spend all that money on gas to go save gas. It's like trying, let's drive to Ohio to save, because they have like 50 cents cheaper gas to come back home. Even though it's going to be a two hour, three hour drive there, I don't know, Phil, I mean, you're going to use half a tank or more going over there and back. I don't know if that really works. Unless you like have a tanker or something in your car or truck or whatever. But gas prices usually are the ones that we kind of talk about next. You know, there are many people who are concerned about these kind of things. And this analogy as a gas tank and wanting to fill it up is the same with our lives. It's an analogy that we can use. We, we have a gas tank that's a simple container uh, that we need to fill up our car and fill it up at a gas station and slowly, uh, you know, use it out. And then we start to feel empty. And then maybe when we get on the E, we start to go... Well, I can hope I can make it to the gas station. I hope I can make it through. Right? <laughs> never on E. You never drive on E. There's a whole series of, uh, I think it's a Seinfeld episode where they, he, he was on E. He said, oh, we should go back now. I said, nope, I want to keep on going. So they kept going down the freeway. And just like they were, and they're like screaming and celebrating because they went like, you know, another 30 miles down. And then all of a sudden ran out of gas. He's like, well, I guess I'm done with the test drive. And that's all it was. He was just test driving his car. He just wanted to check and see. Uh, but sometimes this is the idea relationship that some people have with God. And this isn't true in our spiritual feelings sometimes. We, we do have a spiritual low at times. And we kind of like get down or depressed or worn out. And we have this time... That we need to stop at the gas station and stop at the fill-up station and, 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 and try to see if we need to fill our faith back up. But see, faith is not like the gas tank. And our church is not exactly the gas station and it's merely existing uh, to refill ourselves up every week. You know, and it's interesting because in our, in our uh, scripture today, it's in Luke chapter 17... We start to see that the disciples kind of felt the same way. Now, they didn't have gas tanks to fill up or anything. They might have had vessels to fill up for water, water or whatever. But it was kind of that same thing. So if you look at it, Luke 17, uh, verse 5, it said, the, the apostles said to the Lord, increasing or increase our faith. So that statement right there, just increase our faith. The idea is that I need more faith or I need to counterbalance my faith or my faith is low and theirs is high. And it's like looking at a scale. 
And I want you to understand something. That's not how it works. Faith is not a scale, like little faith, big faith, whatever. Even if it's, it's a faith that you have, it's something that you have. And the disciples were a lot like us in a way that they felt that they needed more faith to be better disciples. We think that all the time. We often look at our life and we're not pleased at what we see. And it, it makes sense that we want to ask for that. If we only had more faith, I could do better as a Christian. I could do better as a disciple. I could do better as a, as a person of faith. I, I could do better if I just had a little bit more faith. And we say this to God sometimes as much as the disciples have said. Uh, increase my faith, please. Before we look at Christ's response, let's go back a little bit uh, into this. And Luke um, kind of starts out in this uh, sections here. It's kind of like instructions. Uh, and they might be a little mixed up or they might be all over the place or they might actually be in the right order. I'm not exactly sure, but it doesn't really matter. We have these instructions. We have these ways of looking at things that Luke has write, uh, written to us. Uh, but the fact is the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write these, and, and there's a meaning for a lot of these things. Previously in Luke, he talked about Lazarus and the rich man, uh, and uh, that was in the book of Luke just before these chapters. And these parables taught about having sincere compassion for people. And I want to look at the first verse of chapter 7 thing, and it's a great responsibility we have uh, as disciples and followers of Christ. Jesus said in Luke 17, chapter 1, chapter 17, verse 1 and 2, Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to the people through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown in the sea with a milestone tied around their neck for them, uh, for him to cause one of them to lose one to sin. See, Christ is warning us about sincere seriousness of sin and our responsibility for our actions and our words. It's a very serious thing that we cause people to have trouble. And even so much so that he wrote in Luke chapter 17, verse 3, he said, so watch yourself. So often we read the first two verses and we start to think, yeah, God got to have uh, people who's going to cause others to stumble. But he's not talking about others trying to make others stumble or even ourselves being stumbled. Many times we are guilty of being that stepping stone or, or that or that block that's in the way or something that's causing the problems. We need to be able to understand the power of our tongue and our words. And the actions that we have. And sometimes we misuse those. In Luke 17 verses 3 and 4. If your brother sins rebuke him. And if he repents forgive him. If he sins again. You seven times in a, in a day. And seven times you come back. And you say I repent and forgive you. It's a slightly different topic. But Jesus is reminding us of two different things in this account. We need to be accountable to others of our brotherly sins and things that are going on in a loving way. We need to be accountable to them as well as those to us, and we need to forgive. See, it's important to show that grace and that mercy. Grace and mercy are the hallmarks of our Christianity faith. Grace is giving something that is not deserved. Mercy is not giving something that is not that is deserved. So we see that Jesus has given some pretty heavy teaching here for the disciples to understand. First about how we need to be careful to not be that stumbling block. And the importance of forgiveness. Now it's if, as if the disciples were feeling all the weight of this on their shoulders. They asked that question. Again, repeating verse 17 or yeah, verse 17, or chapter 17, verse 5. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. So he said to watch out, be careful, be aware, and all these things. And they said, well, in a sense, they're saying, I can't do it unless you give me something more. 
You give me something more. Basically, they're saying, we're not able to do this. We don't give us enough faith to cover it. Please, Jesus, give us more. Otherwise, we'll fall. You're just setting us up for failure. Fill up our tank, Lord, is what they're telling him. We don't have enough. His reply in verse 6, chapter 17, verse 6, he replied, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the seed, and it will obey you. And when you think about this, this is probably not the answer they were looking for. More likely, disciples were like waiting on something where Jesus would say, well, let me pray over you, and I will grant you your wish. You kind of think that that's maybe where they were going with this idea. Oh, let me just touch you, and you have it. To kind of paraphrase this a little bit, what Jesus and the disciples were talking about, you do have faith. Even if it's small, you could do something great. In other words, you already have the faith, you silly disciples. You just need to use it. You just need to use it. The disciples weren't asking for the wrong thing. They just didn't need to increase their faith. They need to increase their faithfulness. Their faithfulness in Christ. They had the faith. They just needed to be faithful in God and his ability to be able to do what it was. This is big and it's different. Faith is the gift that God gives to us. He gives us the amount of faith that we need and it never runs out. To ask God to increase faith is almost kind of an insult. But faithfulness, on the other hand, is our response to that faith, that trust, that ability to know that when God says it, it'll happen. Amen. Faithfulness is different. It's defined as a loyal and obedient person who put trust and faith in Jesus Christ. We all have faithful, uh, are faithful to him. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we put faith in Him. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord, we put our faithfulness in Him. Jesus needs to be both our Savior and Lord. It's not enough to say, thanks, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Now, see you later. That's it. I'm enough. I'm good enough. Just tap me on the shoulder and say, I'm in. We accept salvation and we die. And we no longer are one before. I heard about this story, and I actually read kind of uh, read it the other day, and I thought it was interesting. Uh, there was this gentleman who walked into this one-hour uh, cleaning service, and he brought in his clothes, and he thought, "Oh, I, you know, I can just bring it in, and I'll be back in an hour." So he went in, and he dropped off his stuff, and they said, "Oh, I'll be ready uh, two days from now." And the guy goes. Isn't this a one-hour cleaning, one-hour dry cleaning place? And he said, yeah, that's just the name of the store. It's just a name only. That's like being baptized just to accept the fact that once I'm baptized, that's good enough. That's like saying, oh, God, I put you in my heart. Uh, that's all I need. That's all. It's the checklist of thinking. It's just a name only. He's a whole... Bunch of people out there walking around saying, I'm a Christian, but never walk into a church, never praise his name, never even utter his name unless it's in a swear. But they'll say, I believe in God. I'm a Christian, but it's only a name only. It's just by title. It has no power, it has no strength because there's no faithfulness. In what they're saying. They have to give their entire life. Every part of it. Over to the Lord. And they say God here I am. Wash me. Do as you need to use. <clears throat> when we do that. We are willing to be faithful. And when God says okay. Here's what I need you to do. And this is what we have to do in faithfulness. And as humans. We start to make these kind of excuses. Uh, I, I'm not ready yet. Whoa. Whoa. I'm just asking because I know I have to ask. But if you're telling me to do something, well, then I'm not ready yet. You, you didn't give me enough time. I got to read some more books. I got to learn some stuff. I got to prepare. You ever been in the military 
You spend a lot of times getting prepared right at the beginning of all these things. But once you're in the midst of battle, once you're in the midst of war, and they ask you, get up, go. Well, they don't even ask you. They just tell you, get up and go. You get up and you go. You don't say, I'm not ready. I need more time to practice my shooting. I need more time to do all these things. I need to know how to do all this. First, you had your time. You had your opportunities. And a lot of times God is calling you not because of certain things that you need to learn. It's because he's already prepared it. He's already set something out in front of you before you go. So saying I'm not ready yet, it's not prepared. I need to learn. That is not leading by faithfulness. If you're a Christian and you're ready to do whatever God wants you to do, he's God. He knows and he knows when you are ready and he wouldn't ask if you weren't. And if you're a Christian and you have the Holy Spirit and the gift of faith in your heart and life, all you need is that faithfulness, that trust to be able to step out and rely on his strength. Not on your own, not by you, but by faithfulness. Jesus leaves us with this little short parable. And it kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of even like participation. Luke 17, 7 through 10. But suppose you suppose one of you have a servant plowing and looking after the sheep. Would you say to the servant then, when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and I'll wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants and we have only done our duty. There are many people who do things to be worshipped by other people, even in the church, even in our faith. You got to be careful because we're not out here to do this to get a medal here on earth. We're not getting that participation trophy. Oh, I, I, I participated. I'm here. I did it. Check that off my list. Nope. Sorry. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. When we do good works for God, that's a great thing. But that doesn't pay your way through salvation. That doesn't pay your way in to heaven. It's merely part of the job that we have. And it's the expectation as a servant of the Lord. As a Christian is a servant, therefore Christians are expected to serve and to be faithful. When we get that feeling of something is not quite right and we're not walking with God and maybe we're feeling that lack of faith, it's not the faith, it's that faithfulness. We need to sometimes think that we need to go to church and get me filled up. That's okay. We're going to get low. We're going to have problems. But it's up to you to do it. You can't blame the worship team not playing the right kind of music or the right kind of stuff. You can't blame the pastor not preaching the right sermons or not speaking to me. The Holy Spirit dwells within each one of us. And therefore, God can work in each one of us, in our own hearts. Have you ever noticed those that are spiritually mature seem to have a little bit of a different walk or faithfulness with God? These are the people that think a little different, act a little different. They're willing to do anything that God wants them to do. They're living their lives for him, not for themselves. They're concerned about others and their problems and their tanks not being full. They usually are concerned about uh, those kind of people and the struggles that they have. They know God will take care of their own no matter what. No matter what the problem is, you lose a job, you lose family members, you lose a property, a house, a building, a car, stuff that you think you need. And it doesn't matter because we know that God will be glorified and it will be all for his glory. He will take care of us. I even talked about this a little bit not too long ago, that, that God does provide for us. He does give us prosperities in ways that we maybe don't see or understand. 
These are the right kind of perspectives that we need to have in our, in our lives. And I hope that we can as a congregation and we as believers can have that right perspective. And it starts with our faith and realizing our faith does not run out. Our faith does not run out. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, again, thank you for the opportunity to worship today. We ask that you continue to touch those that are uh, struggling this morning. We know that we have faith in you, Lord Jesus, but sometimes we struggle with the ideas of our own inequities and our own problems, thinking that we can't. It's because we can't, but you can. And we ask that you continue to uplift us and in your precious name. Amen. Please stand and receive the benediction. I'd like to sing the doxology before the benediction, if possible. Please, God, from whom all blessings flow, praise you, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. If you're feeling down, you're feeling tired, feeling like it's not connecting, it's not working, turn to the Lord. Don't ignore it. If there's something tugging at your heart, don't let it prolong. Don't let it sit and fester. Bring it to the Lord. Knowing that our faith in him, controlling this world and the things around us, and it might not be the way that we think it should be or want to be, but God is a part of this world, and if God is part of your life, it'll be different. It'll be changed. It'll be transformed. You'll see the world totally differently. May we honor him. May we worship him and continue to seek him in all that we do, and in his precious name, amen. Go in peace.